Okay. Um, hi, thank you all. Speaking of taking good care of my students, I, I lecture from four to six. I'm like, I've never done a double header before, so I might just be bold on you. <laughs> I, I, I apologize. I'll try to do the best. Uh, that I can, and, and if somebody could find me some water, I should have thought that. Good idea. Uh, do we have a glass? Hmm? Do you, uh, can, can I do it for you? Uh, no, I need one. Because I don't, you have it? All right. Okay, so as Meta said, I started a long time ago. This was when I met in an <laughs> at Harvard. And does anybody ever use these? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. Okay, we're aging themselves. All in all. And so I've been at it a long time, and I've done a lot of statistical studies and some field work, but there comes a time when you gotta sit back. I had my 70th birthday on Sunday, because Meta tells me that's nothing. Um, <laughs> and um, you know, you gotta start thinking about what the implications are. And that's when I got together with Lee Rainey, um, my beloved co-author. We're still talking to each other. We're looking out from Lee Rico. So 4,000 copies, which is pretty good. And um, Lee is the head of the Pew Internet and American Life Project. And he came to me and said, I want to use a book using your ideas. And I said, well, I want you to do, everybody know what a trade book is? Um, not an academic, not a scholarly thing, not a textbook. And I said, I want you to do one too. And Like the stuff they sell in Indigo. <laughs> the stuff I hope they sell. They have one copy of it. Um, I want to be a Heather's pick, right? You know, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, or, thank you very much. And just put it flat. It would be a lot safer. Thank you, Bruce. And um, we're happy. And it, it, it turns, we try to get an agent. I might as well talk about this stuff now, because why not? We're all adults in this room. Um, we try to get an agent. The agents want to only do 20 ways to get rich through doing social networks. And that's <laughs> not the book I want you to write and what you want to write. And so this thing has, it, it's a trade book, it has a great, by the way, who's anybody working on a book now? Do a trade book, not a scholarly book. You get a prettier cover. You get lower prices. <laughs> and this is a great cover, guys. Um, you get lower prices. And with a good press, you get the same quality of print. And we got all our footnotes except they're now end notes. And they're in the back, right? So it's a little bit annoying to flip back and forth. And we're on Kindle. And it's 20 bucks, not 80 bucks. Uh -huh. You know, that's a hell of a difference. Because I don't expect to get rich. I make a buck 20 out of this book. You know? um, but at least I want my ideas to be read, and we want to say, it's I forgot to mention that, of the Pew Internet and American Life Project, which does monthly surveys of how people are using uh, the internet. And anyway, that's, that's the, any questions on that, on book business? The other thing that's totally amusing is the Amazon sales rank. I don't know, anybody have a look at that thing? It's down at the bottom. We go up and down between 9,000 and 34,000. Um, lower is better. And it's totally, I mean, it'll be in two days back and forth, so it's totally kind of, takes to take it seriously. Okay, back now on to substance. I'm gonna take my watch off. Three revolutions have created this new world. Uh, the fourth happened yesterday. It's the death of Big Bird, but we won't get it. <laughs> <laughs> we know who watched the bottom. I guess. <laughs> Actually, what we watched was Obama trying to commit suicide yesterday. It was very, very sad. Yes, yes. And he was amplified on Twitter because my mm -hmm. wife watched it. My wife's in yep. love with Obama. And she thought he was doing okay. Whereas everybody, and all my friends are Twitter people, uh, are Obama people. Twitter, they were saying, my God, what a mess he's making. Mm -hmm. And that becomes become a, a cycle of amplification. They all love the Romney trying to kill the big bird. Um, but everything else was off. So we're going to talk about underlying revolution, I mean, sorry, triple revolution, which I'll get to in a second, underlying structural changes, and then some of the consequences. So, yeah, some science in here is not much piece in here. It's a little piece. Okay. 
So the triple revolution is uh, one, to turn away from groups to networks, two, the internet, and three, uh, mobile. Let me go through that. First, the turn away from groups. Oh, this slide. I'm sorry, I'm still it's a little thin, polishing. Um, groups are densely knit solidarities. The, the most obvious group is a village. It could also be a work group, it could be a church group, it could be a kinship group, but almost everybody knows each other. There's a lot of boundaries around it, uh, and you get a lot of social support and also a lot of social control, and it's the way human beings have basically led, led lived, sorry, I'm sorry, until this century. Um, we now, people worry and have worried since Thomas Jefferson that I can think of, and certainly through the 19th century, that with the move to urbanization, with the move to bureaucratization, with the move to industrialization, and with the growth of technology, starting with trains um, and, and phones, um, that people would become more isolated. That all of these switches would lead people away from groups so they'd be disconnected with each other. Um, as Meta should remember, in the 50s, you, you back then, you were around then too. The U.S. was terrified that in the third world, people would um, leave their traditional villages in Africa and in India, in particular places, China didn't do much about, and move to the cities, and therefore they would be mobilized by evil communists. That was the American meme of the 50s, and it led to the Peace Corps when John Kennedy got elected in the early 60s. Let's artificially build community because they don't have it. Do some of this in chapter two in the book, by the way. Um, and so that was the continuing fear, and that fear continues until three days ago. When, well, last week I was in Halifax, and a really nice report in the Felicity app uh, from CTV Atlantic, which is the you know, Halifax New Brunswick area interviewed me, first question, isn't it true that people are on the internet and they're not relating to each other? And she was a good reporter, she wasn't bad. So that was a setup for me. I said, well, Ms. Yap, isn't it true that people are relating to each other when they're on the internet? Because that's what they're doing, right? Um, well, it's not the same thing. And um, that's, that's been the kind of debate that's been really going on. So what we find is one, that people are in multiple, and we find, as, as Meta mentioned in these drawings, principally where I've done my research, people are in multiple networks, they're not in one little group. I remember when I did my first study way back in 1968, we collected the data, that we found that people, only about 13%, if I remember, of the people who were their close friends and neighbors were in the same community. We're in the same, I'm sorry, we're in the same neighborhood. They were in the network community, but they lived at, well outside of East Europe. People had to travel to find them. That was shocking. I'll never forget, um, when, when was the Spadan Expressway flight? 71. 71. So I was at a meeting to protect neighborhoods down here from the Spadina Expressway. Uh, people, the Alan Powell, who's now dead, Stephen Clarkson, Colin Vaughan, the father of our current older person, uh, Adam Vaughan, were active. And they said, yes, we got to fight our neighborhoods. And I looked around, and I looked where they were coming from. Most of them had driven in. Right? They weren't local neighbors. They were, I'm not picking on these good, outstanding left-wing citizens, but the notion of a community being a neighborhood wasn't true then, and it's even now true now. When we did our first study in 69, the average East Yorker, and East Yorker was a pretty good place to study this, as single family homes then, homogeneously Anglo-Saxon, only knew five people in their own neighborhood, and only had talked to two of them in more than a tri trivial relationship. So that was then. Now it's even more. But that doesn't mean people are isolated. It means their relationships have developed in other ways. So they have longer distance is with their relation. I'm going to talk in the first five minutes about that. Um, the spatial boundaries are unimportant. They're not linked to kinship boundaries. Zachary, you heard this stuff about five years ago? So tell me if it's changed at all. Okay. 
took my course at two years ago. Um, and um, they're cycling among multiple communities and are only giving partial attention to each. So say how you study depression among people and do you find that when people don't have one community to grab onto that they feel more depressed? because they have partial relationships in a bunch of communities, and you're not setting it up that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. um, secondly, the internet's come along, and we all know the obvious about the internet, that distance has not died, but it's become weakened. Uh, many people have, everybody have friends and relatives, well, Saka does, I know, back in Japan. Um, anybody else have in home mm -hmm. countries or towns anywhere else? Yeah, yeah where? Oh, yeah. Germany. Germany? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, me in New York, um, and so clearly we can connect with them. Starting with email, we can collect really, really well with them. In fact, made it better. But the thing that strikes me about the internet is it's personal. That's the first thing you do when you get on is you log in, right? And you log in as a person. It's a personalized relationship, rather than when a phone, when Meta calls my house. Either I or my wife can answer, and the other one will be listening to the phone call. That's a fundamentally different things than just she and I talking to each other. I don't have many secrets, so it's not a big deal, but um, it becomes a person-to-person -person relationship rather than a household-to-household -household relationship. And the last thing is the thing that hope everybody should sort of shut off is their mobile phones um, or their laptops. Or their tablets, no tablets around, no tablets out. Anybody, anybody have a tablet tucked away? <laughs> <laughs> the notion is that it's with you at all times. If you're a guy, it's in your pocket and vibrates. Uh, I can come up with some pornographic puns on that, I can make you vibrate. If you're a woman, it's mostly in your handbag. It's like, oh, I don't understand why. I mean, I, I think it's a phony excuse when women say, I didn't hear the phone is up in your handbag. Get a pocket, put your phone in there. And that has two things. One, it makes information accessible to you. So if you, if you want to dispute anything I say about some Pew Internet data, you can go on to pewinternet.org and, and, and find it out. Uh, you can make people are accessible to you. So if Sayaka is, is doing I can send her a text and say, stop playing with your, stop with your phone now. Um, I shouldn't try that in my class. Uh, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, I do a cool thing in my, my class is 100 people. It's over in Sid Smith, and it's a tiered thing. So I, it's still going to do here, but I have a remote on it. So I've been going up to the top of the room and looking down on students. And that means they can't text their boyfriends or their girlfriends. And, um, and one guy had porn as his screensaver. <laughs> I had to point out to him that that wasn't, it was probably sexual harassment because there were women sitting around him. Um, you know, we don't ever really think of it like that, but it could be an issue. So we're available to others whether we like it or not. Uh, and that means we, there's a danger of being on 24-7. Um, this is a pretty old group. Not to, you know, older than my undergrad. Any undergrads here? Okay, a couple. Uh, anybody sleep with their phones, literally in bed with them? <laughs> One guy. Well, two guys. One third of my undergrads say they do. I haven't obviously checked. I don't even say take a picture. Um, the other, almost everybody else sleeps with the phone on their night table. Uh -huh. So it, it's a personal uh, kind of thing. And that varies by age, and it varies by marital status, because I live in a house with four stories, and I'm not walking around with my phone with all the time, but we have five home phones. About a third of my class of 20-year-olds do not have home phones. Anybody here without a home phone? Ooh. Oh, yeah. Are you all single? Good question. <laughs> My choice? Or, yeah. No? You're, you and your partner each have your own phones. And how do you talk to each other? you call each other? Uh, she has texted me for when I'm in the basement. <laughs> Okay, so it's, 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 a, it's an individualizing world, but it's a networked individualizing world because you are texting each other. There's a wonderful German cartoon that I can't find anymore with a husband and wife sitting and each reading the newspaper at breakfast, walling off from, from each other. 
So one of the things that's happening is um, the transition from at atoms to bits. Uh, by an atom, I mean the material culture. We know until the 1970s or so in America and I think in Japan, people basically made stuff or they traded what they made. Um, they were making goods, they were growing things, they were mining things, we still do that, it's called the oil sands. But all of the developed world economies has changed into a digital, a bit-based economy. I stole that term from Nicholas Nicolapante, found in the MIT Media Lab, in which we move stuff around. I would assume everybody in this room is a bit worker, right? You move, you're moving things around, you maybe drawing on a screen, you're working with a screen of some sort. Anybody not? His primary job is, is in manufacturing or selling goods and stuff. Be surprised. You yeah. so What do you do? You know, I manage an apartment building. I manage an apartment building. Yeah, it's a big deal. That's Adam. Yeah, you're right. um, and when the change to bit working is a really powerful change. Because, remind me, remind me of a screen on. I haven't said anything bad. Okay. Yeah. Because it means you can work remotely as you, what's your name? Brian. Brian, you probably work remotely and uh, do computer type stuff too because you're a geek, you know, whatever you manage. Um, you can work separately so that Ned and I can communicate about this talk. Well, we finally did manage to have lunch the other day uh, on it. You can work in a distributed sense so that your partner that you're working with, you could be sending your paper back and forth or you can be using Google Docs, use some all the time. Um, and so it's a profound kind of change in how we organize our lives. And it affects public-private boundaries. If you were in Oshawa building cars for General Motors, you couldn't take that work home with you unless you were a senior manager. But if you're here at U of T or writing papers or you're an advertising agency, just think about how Mad Men, I assume we've all seen that, would be like now. They'd be dispersed. Um, they might not be coming in for their scotches and whiskeys and shenanigans. They could be working out of their homes. When Ned and I were at Harvard in the late 60s, one of the big rituals at Harvard every Friday was something called Sherry Hour where all the big potentates like Topka Partons, Drew's Homans, and the little people like Meta and I uh, would gather every Friday at 4 o'clock in the apartment would, would pour wine and stuff like that, and we'd all schmooze and gossip and some of the famous people. That still exists, except the big people don't come in. I have a student, undergrad, who's now gone to Harvard, and she says, they don't come in, they're busy working at home, or who knows what they're doing. So there's loss of that kind of face-to-face -face community isn't going on. Anyway, this is a repeat. We've now moved from these place-based, densely knit groups to more far-flung, sparsely knit um, things. This is the picture of the old village. I think, no, I don't have a picture up here. Um, it's the first time I've used a little netbook. It's actually keeping up with me. That's pretty impressive. Um, to this kind of, uh, hello, where's this? Oh, this is, yeah, doesn't it? I can't get an arrow to move around when I'm on this. Not when it's in a, not when it's in a slideshow. Okay. Um, so, as I said, and this is basically what I've repeated, the things of claims that things are falling apart. Sherry Turkle wrote a book with almost minimal evidence. She watched her daughter play online, and she watched people walking around MIT. Uh, Meta, you're a sociologist. You were at one time. What's the sampling problem? <laughs> Let me put you on the spot. Uh, with studying MIT students as a sample of normal human behavior. <laughs> no, they're not like the other folks. The geeks, right? The weird, weird <laughs> geeks and stuff. So. Turkle actually, actually it turns out, Cal, no, it's not MIT, but Caltech is at, at the top of the list mm -hmm. now of universities. I saw in the that. World. I didn't remember where it Beat out Harvard by yep. three or four yeah. points. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know why MIT is, Harvard has fallen from 20 to 21 if you take that stuff seriously. And one of the reasons I'm convinced, because I can fake it like anybody, is they underfund the social sciences here. So. Yeah, that's true. I sure do. Um, 
Any, we have any real scientists here? In Science for Peace? No? Because we're organizing a talk at the end of this month about how something called the Canada Foundation for Innovation, which was started by Paul Martin, um, seriously discriminates by giving, funneling more money into the physical sciences and less into, into social science and humanities and, and discriminates spatially between universities. So U of T does better than Brock or Laurentian, for example. Anyway, there's been these continuing arguments that things were falling apart. Bob Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, which had data, unlike Ternese or Turkle, um, was probably the most best known of, of that. Putnam showed that from the 60s to the mid-90s, that organized groups in America were declining. Bowling Alone means it used to be organized bowling meets. Anybody ever remember Laverne and Shirley? They used to have bowling team names on their back. Um, and now people don't go bowling in those leagues. People don't belong much to churches, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what they do do, though, and Bob missed this, is they, they network a lot more. Social movements, as Meadow points out, um, in the Egyptian sense, was somewhat organized uh, through, through social media and networks, although later got taken over by a very organized group called the Muslim Brotherhood. And Meta, some of your friends were actually trained the original network people in how to do civil disobedience. They came, uh, came the Serbians who I think had been trained by the American guy, Gene, what's his name? Sharp. Gene Sharp trained the Serbians. Serbians trained the, the original the Egyptians in nonviolent protest and how to wear your gas mask and what you put up with stuff. <laughs> Useful things like that. Um, and so there was the interplay between them. I got a lovely picture in my book of a lot of people gathered around a power bar which they had tapped into a street light interior square. And that was the way they were getting power for their cell phones where they were twittering and sending photos out um, going on there. And we have another photo um, which says, we are the Facebook generation from that same moment. And it turns out not that many people in, in Cairo or in Egypt are in Facebook, although more in Cairo than elsewhere. But Facebook became a symbol of we are the new people. We are not your father's people. Um, we are the new, modern, progressive, plugged into the rest of the world kind of people going on. And that became a, a symbol of, of, of some of the discontent that people had in Egypt. And Meta may remember there was a book in the 1950s by Daniel Lerner called The Passing of Traditional Society, whose dominant image was of a Bedouin riding on a camel, but with a transistor radio hanging from the saddle. And that was his way of plugging in. So this is kind of recurrent traditional technology modernity thing going on. Um, so, ah, I think I'm going to skip some of this. Yeah, let me know. I'll, go, I'll do it. Anyway, the media loves the fact of social, loves the charge of social isolation, even if it's not true. And so, um, when three friends of mine, good scholars, Millen McPherson, Lins, her husband, his husband, Lynn Smith Lovett, and Matt Brashears, came out with this study called Social Isolation in America. Good study, lousy title. Um, they found that the number of people Americans talked to and discussed important matters with, I'm sorry, had gone from 2.9 to 2.1, and that a lot of them didn't have anybody to talk to. So, Yaka, what are you finding? A lot of people don't have anyone in your study recounting those things in your study of depressive people? Uh, yes. Uh uh, I'm trying to see uh, the ratio of um, the way people living with depression and spend time with, uh, with people in real life as opposed to uh, spending some time online. Mm -hmm. okay. So there's some of isolation going on here. Yeah. And the media just lapped, sorry guys, lapped this up. You know, we need a computer that's optimized for PowerPoint, like big page up and page down. And they called me up and I said, well, it ain't true. And it turns out the data was bad. It wasn't there for NORC screwed up the data collection. 
big time. Um, the, I don't want to go into all the technical stuff. It turns out as much as or only 10% of Americans have no one to talk to, it's not 23% mm. when you reanalyze. It's still a lot, but it's a, but it's a lot less. And I don't think this place to go technical on that. But the media love that stuff. And what we've noticed is something we call localization, that there's people with ties going across to Germany or Guyana, and, but also local. Every time we do a study, and we as about eight people by now have done serious, rigorous research, both qual and quantum, and we'll quality analysis now, is we find that the most common relationships, the most frequently emailed, the most frequently Twitter, even tweeted, are local. Are people in your town, in Toronto, or wherever you have you. Less so on Twitter than on email, because email leads to follow through, as does Facebook. Well, I haven't really studied Facebook yet. Um, and we did a Twitter study, and we found out Twitter relationships basically follow airline routes, because that's where the important relationships go. So Toronto, LA is more important than Toronto, St. Louis, even. So it's not just a distance kind of thing. Um, so it's global and it's local. But people have lots of ties. And we have something that I call the more, the more. The more ties you have online, the more ties you have offline. It is totally wrong that people who spend a lot of time online have no ties offline. Nevertheless, the DSM, everybody knows what the DSM is, the uh, Fictional Psychiatric Indicator. He's going to come out with internet addiction in the next day. The thing is so political. They just got rid of homosexuality as evil, but now being on the internet is evil. There's no data for that, by the way. Um, so I want to go ahead. Yeah. So one of the structural bases for it, this is where I think I'll just head the talk tonight, is that around us, who's the youngest person in this room? You probably, maybe. When were you born? Up here. 1992. 1992. My God, your childhood. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Even since then, there's been major structure. 1990. 1990. Okay. Yeah. So, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in '42. I would never speak for herself. Um, <laughs> 31. <laughs> Freshman girl. Yeah. Okay. First off, we've we've had a growth. In of, of the number of people, of households that have at least two people, of multiple car households. And that means that when I was a kid, we would go out for a quote family drive on Sunday because we only had one car, 1948 Dodge, very um, Now each person takes his or her car and goes wherever they want to. This is all American data. Because Americans won't read Canadian data. Did I make a mistake? What, what happened? No, no, maybe. No, I'm just, because I'm interested in, uh, in climate change and when I'm seeing these figures, it's very interesting what, how that relates to, uh, mm -hmm. to emissions, uh, carbon emissions. And in the book, I'll be, in the, by the book, you'll find a footnote that will tell you where we got the data from. Right. Um, we, everything is really documented. Number of miles driven has gone up a bit, but per car, but the number of um, cumulative miles as number of cars grow has gone way up. Um, one of my friends wouldn't try to get on an airplane for a while because she was afraid it was polluting the atmosphere, but everybody else is getting on airplanes, despite the best effort of Air Canada and Delta and all of an aeroflot to make us feel miserable when we're on there. I did a show up with Air Canada here on uh, about a week ago and said, hi, I'm an hour and a half early. Can you get an earlier flight? Sure, 150 bucks. Well, I had a conversation with them that ended in the word you. Um, and so um, what we're finding is deregulation has really lowered prices, tremendously so, and it's become a lot safer. And the trend line is almost directly up. I didn't have to log, log this or anything like that. You can just see it going up. Um, the Airbus 380 hasn't really done much. There are not that many 
showing, but the, three, the 767, the 777, the 330 have really helped. Uh, one of the things, certainly transcontinentally, that's helped is the legalization of two engine planes. So 747s don't fly much, but 67s and 77s, 777s do um, wherever they're going. And that means we can stay connected. You go home to Guyana every once in a while, see your relatives. I've been here. I, I, I recently moved here about four years ago. So. But you haven't been back since? No. Oh, my God. <laughs> there we go. Come on, your mother misses you. Oh, no, my family's here. Right. But most people are going Skype. back, and most people are traveling around. I asked Meta where her associate editor was. Oh, she's somewhere in Europe, somewhere. <laughs> but she's a Filipina, originally. So, you know, we all get around, you know? Uh, I was in Halifax. That's not far in. It's, it seems far in. Um, but, yeah. And import and exports are both going up. Imports are basically coming from China, as Mitt Romney pointed out. He didn't point out that he was exporting capital to many of these countries. Um, U.S. exporting is dropping. And of course, the, this is one of the few charts that Canadian stuff would look differently with the less things of oil. Mitt kept saying, we're going to make North American energy self-sufficient. And we kept tweeting, oh, we Canadians sort of had the say in that too, Mitt. Think about that. Um, and then this is from uh, the store you meet some of you may go to, Fiesta Farms. Anybody been to Fiesta Farms? Uh, Christine Northfield Floor. When I was pre prepping the book, I wandered around and just looking at the fruits and veggies. This is a mashup. Each one of those square uh, rectangles is a separate photograph that we cropped and put together. But we didn't really uh, fake anything. Yeah, we, the chili thing wasn't photographing well, so we broke it in the word chili. I'm certainly from Chile. You can see where all the stuff's coming from. I mean, this wasn't a time of our growing season, but our growing season basically doesn't exist. Um, so, I mean, we're very mobilized. And then this is the one that, that, this is my peace slide. Believe it or not, and some people here will not believe it, we have more peace in the world now if you define peace as interstate conflict between two formally organized governments. I mean, I'm, being careful there. Um, in the last war we had was the US uh, bringing democracy to Iraq. I speak ironically, of course, uh, in 2003. There's a lot of people killing each other within a country. Um, there's a lot of outsiders helping people within a country to fight against something that's happening in Syria now. Um, but, but very, very little. Um, um, and, you know, Syria gets a lot of news, and every person who dies is a shame. But the US, Germany, Britain, oh, excuse me, Britain, Russia, used to, Japan used to kill as many people in one or two nights in World War II with bombings than happens now in all of the Syrian conflict. Um, I haven't checked my numbers. I may be wrong. So state-to-state -state conflict has a lot more potential to kill a lot of people. They have bigger stuff. You're fight for me, on that? You're right. I mean, Pinker. Pinker. Yeah. Who said? Uh, Stephen Pinker. Okay. Yeah, well, I didn't copy from him, but we're. And, the other, and so people can move around a lot more. Who's been in Europe this summer? West Europe. So, did you get your passport out much after you landed? I'm also European. Well, Europe. doesn't matter. Because the Schengen Agreement basically says throughout much of Europe, uh, you don't need a passport. You can move freely, which is why every chambermaid in France is Polish or Romanian, because the EU has driven labor mo mobility and and um, tourist mobility uh, is also. You, you know. So, if you ever saw the original day of the jackal, the good version, not the horrible one, the original year, where it was France and they were they, they caught the guy. They went through a million little defeches, the little registration cards. With the that's ancient news. You can just move around there. Yeah. Um, remember, I was driving with my wife between France and Italy, and she said, when are we going over the border? I said, remember those two fat guys that were leaning on the lamppost? That was Italian immigration. <laughs> they looked at us. They really were out of shape. You know? um, <laughs> so 
lots of boundaries are moved up. Um, and we see stuff going on. Let's see, yeah, I did this. This is, this is a memory test for me. My favorite, the most gorgeous human being who ever lived, he's still alive, he's not gorgeous anymore, I think was Sidney Poitier. Mm -hmm. And he starred in this movie called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner in 1967. The movie's plot was very basic and kind of strange now. It is um, the young woman whose name I always forget, and she's not in the lead titles, calls up her parents, Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn, and says, Mommy, Daddy, guess what? I'm in Hawaii. I met this gorgeous man. He can serve. He has a great body. Oh, and he's a doctor, and he's well-spoken, and the guy gets on and charms the parents. And we're coming home three days from now so that you can meet him. And they show up at the door, and that's the, the big reveal scene. Guess what? They look like that. Sorry, I'm pointing that way. This, this thing doesn't point that way. Um, and they look like, you get the idea. Yeah. By the way, they made a remake which bombed a few years ago where they reversed it and had a black guy. And uh, had a, a white guy and a, and, a, and a black woman and people shrugged and said, yeah, this is new. Um, and so that was the whole bloody movie. And of course, being good liberals, the filmmakers standing Kramer and, and all the actors were good liberals. At the end, everybody was happy. But this was big news in 67. A couple of little things. In 1967 is when the US Supreme Court did a decision which had a wonderful name. Anybody know it besides me? Loving versus the US. The couple's name was Loving. What a great name. Loving versus Virginia. So, uh, Virginia and 16 other states had laws outlawing interracial marriage. It was forbidden in those states to get married, you can go to jail. It's, if you want to look at it now, the footnotes in the book. Um, and the US Supreme Court, to its great credit, that's when the US Supreme Court had integrity, uh, said that uh, it's illegal according to the US Constitution, which forbids discrimination on the basis of race, uh, to have laws outlawing racial marriage, and you can't do that. And it pretty well faded away right away. It didn't get fought too much. Now we got things that this couple, I don't know what color he is, but he's sure in white. Um, <laughs> Guyana? <laughs> no? no? I don't know where it's from. But we have eHarmony commercially advertising an interracial couple. Uh, when you're ready to find the love of your life, this stuff is so non controversial, except maybe in Mississippi, that you can sort of do this stuff and hope to make money out of it. You know, one day maybe gays will be there too. Um, we haven't seen that yet because it's not quite in the Constitution. It is in our country, it isn't in the US of sexual orientation as being illegal. So, uh, boundaries are loosening up. Uh, religious boundaries are. Meta, what's the name of the building where your, where your Peace Magazine is? Oh, it's a... Uh, it's a United Church. What Formerly Trinity St. Paul's Trinity Church, Saint Paul. which can make ends meet, can't get a congregation, so they rent out most of the building to all these left liberal groups like Meadows, right? And, and Tefl music used to be there until they moved into the concert hall. So we're finding church, part of it is the move from downtown to the suburbs, but part of it is the migration away from the former big mainstream religious WASP and to some extent Catholic uh, groups in the US, Canada, and, and certainly Western Europe, and I don't know what that, uh, about the rest of it. They may exist in buildings, although they, they're closing a lot down, but they have very small congregations. I'll just do an anecdote. I was in Bellagio, Italy. About three years ago, we went to church just for the hell of it. A nice Jewish boy he wants to see what Italian church services. There were only grandmothers and their grandsons, little 12 year olds that they can or less that they could force to go with them to, to church to keep granny happy. The whole middle of generations were there, and I think that's a pretty common kind of thing. So people in the US more than anywhere still say they're religious and they believe in God, much more in the US than Canada, by the way. But they're not, except for the evangelicals, they're not putting their money with their mouth is, and the Mormons. Uh, which reminds me. Name the first election where there's not a wasp running for office in the US, in the main, in the main national candidates. This one. Who do we got? We got a Mormon, right? 
running against an evil black Muslim terrorist. And we got two, that's Barack Obama in case you didn't know. And then we got uh, two, I mean, and, and if you read the Tea Party stuff, that's what they say. But he certainly isn't a wasp. Would you agree on that? He look, look, act like it, but he isn't. Uh, and then they got two new Catholics running for vice president, Biden and Ryan. And the U.S. Supreme Court, which used to be very carefully balanced for, they would only allow one Jew, and then they would to two Jews, and they would one two Catholics, is now six Catholics, including a Latino woman, but let's get that, and three Jews, not a wasp on the Supreme Court. This, this is a major change from when Netta and I grew up, where there was strong Protestant, I mean, see madmen, madmen, they go nuts when they hire a black secretary and a Jewish copy editor who's as brash as I am, and they don't know what to do with it because he doesn't have the right manners. This is in the 60s. Watch a great movie with Gregory Peck called Gentleman's Agreement from about that time, where Gregory Peck was hypermanic and, and, and very waspy, discovers he's Jewish, and how he starts acting against what he'd grown up with. It's a very interesting movie. So I'm going to basically finish up here. We've had a, a tremendous shift away from the traditional boundaries to networks, to using the computer. You guys see the broadband stuff going on there. Um, most, anybody still have dial up here? You probably won't admit it to me, but I doubt it. <laughs> anyway, anyway, there is a girl in my class, and she's basically unemployed. It has dial up. Dial -up. But it, it's rare. And we now have over, this slide's a little old. In the US, it's hit 80% penetration rate for having some sort of computer. This thing's showing about 70%. Almost all the people who don't have internet access don't want it. It's a myth that they can't afford it. Um, if they can't afford it, they almost always can find a place where they can go to, such as a library or a community center. They don't want it because often they're old. And what happens to old people? You know what happens to old people? They'll be here. They die. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> higher probability. I mean, it's a hundred percent probability you're going to die. Uh, but you know, hopefully it'll take a while. Um, but so when you get people like me who've been on the internet or something like it since 1975, we now become the old people. I'm 70 now, um, and. So the really old people who don't want to use this stuff are basically passing away or doing the next best thing in a hospice care or something. Do we give internet in a hospice care? I don't know if that should be a palliative. I don't know. We'll have to check on that. Um, and we know the gender gap, which used to be real, and is still somewhat real in Europe. Japan? Still more guys than women in Japan? Do you know? I think so. You haven't been back in that, probably. Uh, but that's basically dying. Uh, the racial gap has died, and we have black Americans on cell phones more than white Americans on. Um, and it plays out, and nobody's going to lie a little bit different than the internet. So, I'm not saying this is a better world, but it's certainly a different world that's happening imperceptibly, and it's more than just these toys in our pockets. It's changing the whole way in which we relate to each other, and that's basically the talk I want to give. So, thank you.